I'm going to get my breakfast. I have my source sheets. Okay, here we go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, Bruchim Habaim to Matan Bay Chemish's annual Bain Tessa Lassor program. Um, welcome to those online and those on site. I hope both audiences will benefit from and learn from this shoe-rim and understand that this new hybrid, now this hybrid technology is new to me and we're trying our best and hopefully, it, you know, it won't go out with, uh, we won't have too many glitches. Uh, what I actually want to do before I open up to the current Achsanya is I want to start with a very special thank you. And I don't know if she's on here. Oh, thank you. My name is Melissa Raymond. I'm the director of Matan Bechemesh. I'm also the assistant director of Eshkolot, um, which is a Matan program for um, Tanakh studies in Yerushalayim. And Okay, so as I said, I wanted to have a very say a very, very special thank you, not to our current host yet, but to our previous host, who I'm not sure if she's on this uh, Zoom or not. I don't want to scroll through and find her or not, but Renat and Yaakov Green hosted this year, basically, for the last 11, 12 years. Um, it wasn't always a Matan year, that was like later, but still, uh, they host, opened up their home through thick and thin uh, for years and years of power learning, one day a week uh, with Rabbi Nishani Tarragon, Rabbi, then Rabbi Menachem Liebtag joined the, the uh, program and others have uh, given shiurim there as well. Um, and they would open up their home even if they weren't home, uh, even if they were making a simcha that night or something, they still, everyone would just traipse through the house um, and uh, the Torah learning would go on. For that, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and I believe Shani's going to talk about that more later. Um, as to our current host, we are so thankful that Rabbi Myers approached Rabbi Shani Tarragon about giving her Sunday morning shear in the newly named Beit Midrash in memory of Rabbi Dr. Abraham J. Torsky, the Kornel of Rachat. Um, and by the way, the launching of their learning center is um, next month on the 13th. There are flyers and information over there. Maybe I can, I can share it in the chat if you'd like as well. Um, the request, Rabbi Ryan's request came just as we were figuring out how to host the Matan Bechemesh RBS branch in light of Corona and, you know, not being, you know, having to do hybrid and not exposing Renat's kids to Corona, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was, a, it was gonna be a challenge to have this year. And now uh, Baruch Hashem, um, this is a very exciting um, match between Matan Bechemesh and um, this Beit Midrash. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure working with the bars. Um, thank you so much. It's your, your, your dedication to this project and to my sheer is amazing and we greatly appreciate it. Um, and this will, there, going forward, this will be the home of the RBS branch on Sunday mornings. Um, so we'll be meeting here and um, there's a flyer about the schedule of all the Matan Bay Chemish classes on the table there and it's on the website. I just want to remind everybody that this is a Tavirok somewhat compliant event, meaning we're under 50 people, but it's a Tavirok event, so everyone has to keep your masks on at all times, please. Um, there is coffee out back, but if you take you guys online, you can drink your coffee and not wear a mask if you want. It's one of the <laughs> benefits that you guys have. Um, but if you need to take a break, please go outside. If you want to drink your coffee, I, please drink it outside. There's also refreshments out there. So um, don't eat in, in the building. Without further ado, sorry. <laughs> Our first year is by Rabbi Johnny Solomon, who has been teaching with us for the past two years. He's originally from London and is a Jewish educator and writer with degrees in math, religious studies, and a master's in Jewish education. He has smicha from Montefiore Kolel. While in London, Rabbi Johnny held numerous senior positions, including the head of Jake studies at both Emmanuel College and at Hasmonean Girls School. In 2012, Baruch Hashem, Rav Jani Medalia, with his wife Dana and their five daughters, 
and he divides his time between teaching at Madrashat Lindbaum and Matan, working as a Jewish education consultant, editing books for Mosaica Press, and providing online spiritual coaching, halacha consultations, and one-on-one -on -one learning to men and women around the world. Beyond this, Rav Jani writes a popular daily Dafyomi thought, which I often read, and he is a contributor to the RZ Weekly podcast. He's a post at his local shul, and he is a board member of Chochmat Nashim. So, yeah. Sorry, but appreciated. And welcome to all those joining us online. I hope you can hear us well. I must apologize because though the title which I plan to speak about related to Rabbi Tversky on recovery, I will be quoting the very same piece that I intended to share with you. Over Shabbat, as I was spending a little bit more time looking ahead towards the shield, considering which additional karot to share with you, I had somewhat of a revelation. A few ideas came together that I didn't see yet coming together. And as a result of that, I've amended the title to be a little bit more aligned to some of the things we're going to be talking about. And that's the title of the shield is Moshe, Yona, and Rabbi Tversky on finding ourselves. Beyond this, because I finished putting together some of the ideas I thought about on Shabbat at about two in the morning, forgive me if some of the ideas I'm going to be reading, you have a Dachma Kohot, and anybody who's particularly interested, I don't know if there'd be anyone, who uh, would like to see some of the things that I'll be reading from beyond the Kohot that you have yourselves, I'd be happy to send you an overall transcript of the Shiel afterwards. My email address is on the Dachma Kohot. So, what I'd like to do today is share what I hope is somewhat of an original reading of Sefer Yonah, which of course we'll be reading at Mincha on Yom Kippur, which is drawn from, inspired by, and uh, expanded from a profound insight of Rabbi Twersky that we're going to be looking at a little bit later on. But in order to get to Rabbi Tversky's insight, in order to understand Yonah, I want to begin with a different biblical figure, perhaps the greatest of biblical figures, and certainly someone whose life we're thinking about very significantly in the Parashiot Shavua, that is Moshe Rabbeinu. And so what we're going to do for much of our learning is speak about Moshe, then speak about Yonah, and see how certain parallels can be identified in their lives. So who is Moshe Rabbeinu? Well, Moshe's early life was a mix of miracles, challenges, and admittedly self-doubt about who he was, and about what he was capable of. When Moshe was born, we're told that his house was filled with light. And he was subsequently saved from the water from Baibat Paro. At the same time, he spent much of his early years displaced in the Egyptian palace. And according to some of Farshim, he was at the time not fully sure to whom and to what nation he belonged. Was he a Mitzri or was he an Ivri? However, at least according to the Ibn Ezra, the turning point in Moshe's identity crisis was when he saw a Mitzri hitting an Ivri. And if you see on the Dapei Makarot, here I'm going to be quoting from Shemot Perek Bet. V'yar ish Mitzri make ish Ivri mechav. And he saw a Mitzri hitting an Ivri from among his brothers. According to Ibn Ezra, uh, beforehand, he was unsure, who is my brother? And then the pain he felt when seeing the Ivri being hit by the Mitzri affirmed his identity. And what does he do? <laughs> he hits and kills the Egyptian and covers him in sand. By this point, Moshe had been saved both by water and by sand, by water in terms of being put in the basket, and by sand in terms of hiding the body 
of the Mitzri. I and mean, this is why when later on, when he came to meet out the first of the Makot, Dam Tzvardea Kinim, it wasn't he who carries out those Makot, but instead it is Aaron, because Moshe Rabbeinu has Hakarat Atov, appreciation to the water and to the sand that had saved him. Moshe hits Dimitri, he kills him, he hides him in the sand. And so what does he do? He's in trouble. His now his life is at stake in Mitzrayim. And so he flees. He flees to Midian. And while at a well defending Yitzhak's daughters, something strange happens. You'll see in Perekbet, Pasuk Yotet, he's identified as a mitzri, can you see? But Amarna ish mitzri hatilanu miyad haroim. He's identified as an Egyptian. And according to the Sefer Hasidim, not only was Moshe wrong for not correcting this misrepresentation of him, but in fact, he was punished by this. You can see the Sefer Hasidim in source two. What does it say? Israel Shomea Shomeralav Shugoi Tarik Loma Yudiani. A Jew who hears that they are being identified as being somebody not Jewish needs to challenge that and say, actually, I'm Jewish. Minalan, how do we know this? We know this from Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu pleased HaKadosh Baruch He says, I wasn't worthy to enter the land. We read them right now. Right now at the end of the Torah. Moshe was not able to merit being in Eretz Israel as we are right now. He said, at least let my bones, let my bones be buried in Eretz Yisrael, like Yosef. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu says the Sefer Chassidim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu responds to Moshe Rabbeinu. Somebody who acknowledges the land will be buried in the land. But Yosef, who identified himself as being somebody who comes from Eretz Yisrael, he, he was worthy that his bones were to be buried in Eretz Israel. But you, when you were silent, having heard that you were identified as being a Mitzri, you did not pro proclaim proudly, I am an Ivri. Therefore, your bones are not going to be taken into the land. We could debate the, the message, the punishment, and the crime of what is being conveyed here by the Sefer Hasidim. But I want us to dwell on this important idea. The Moshe is identified as a Mitzri, and according to the Sefer Hasidim, fails to proclaim loudly and proudly, unequivocally, Ivri Anochi, I am a Hebrew. Once a person belongs to the Jewish nation, their task is to know who they are. Their task is to know who is Anochi, who am I? Their task is to identify themselves as an Ivri. Now, Moshe is now in Midian, and what happens in Midian? What happens is a revelation. It's a revelation where Moshe Rabbeinu comes upon the snare, doesn't he? And we see, in, if you look at source 3 from Shemot, Peragimel from Shemot chapter 3, He sees the snare, it's burning in fire, and yet it's not being consumed. Moshe sees this extraordinary sign. 
in the desert, a strange bush in fire and yacht being consumed. He doesn't understand what this is meant to represent. It's at this point HaKadosh Baruch Hu speaks to him. He talks to him. He tells Moshe about the anguish of Am Yisrael B'Mitzrayim, and he tasks him with a duty to redeem Am Yisrael. I see my people crying. I see the pressure they're under. Go and save them. And what does Moshe say in response? Does he say, sure, I'll go right now. Whatever you say, Kodesh Baruch Moshe responds with these curious words. This is in Pasuk Yud Aleph. <laughs> Who am I that I'm going to go to Pharaoh and that I'm going to take Am Yisrael Mimitzrayim? Now, on first glance, this simply seems to be a lack of confidence. Do I have the skill set to do that? I'm a really qualified. Will they let me into the palace? However, as Rabbi Sachs explains, there is also an echo of an identity crisis. Rare in those days, though all too familiar now in these words. Who after all was Moshe? A child hidden in a basket of reeds, found and adopted by an Egyptian princess, given an Egyptian name and brought out in Pharaoh's palace. By upbringing, he was an Egyptian. By birth, he was a Jew. Mi anochi is a question about who am I? He's asking about his very essence of being anochi. Just prior to this, he was identified as a Mitzri and didn't respond. He's still figuring out fully what his identity is. Nevertheless, after a period of seven days of Hashem's cajoling Moshe to take position of leader of Am Yisrael and to redeem Am Yisrael from Mitzrayim, Moshe eventually, though still somewhat reluctantly, capitulates. And he steps up to his mission as leader of the people, which culminated in leading the people on the dry land through the water and eventually to House Sinai, where over a period of 40 days, he received the Torah, which he soon taught to the people. As we know, at least when Moshe brought down the first Luchot, he was confronted by Bnei Yisrael serving the Egel Azahav. But what did Moshe do at that moment? Just a few chapters later, what does he do? He defends Am Yisrael. He tells Hashem, this in Shemot chapter 32, If you'll please forgive their sins, fine. If not, blot me out from the book that you have written. Moshe is the ultimate defender of Am Yisrael. He's prepared to give up parts of himself for the people. And after Moshe achieves appeasement for the people, Hashem then does something remarkable. He reveals to Moshe the Yud Gimel Midot Shel Rachamim, the 13 attributes of mercy. We know these verses because we read them, and especially on Yom Kippur. Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum Hanun, Erech Apaim Rav Chesed, Vemet. Hashem reveals to Moshe how to seek pardon from God. What to do when the people sin and they will. He's told by God they're going to sing again. But because Moshe was so ardent, so committed to defend Am Yisrael, Hashem says, next time say this to me. Next time, do this for me. Whenever Am Yisrael sin, these attributes should be done in this order and they'll be pardoned. 
as we see, if you see source five, were it not a verse saying this, it would be impossible to express these words. Wraps himself as a shneach tzibur. And he shows to Moshe the order of prayer. And he says to him, all the time that Israel, the Jewish people sin, do for me like this order and I will pardon them. This is Moshe. He grows up, miraculous beginning, question of identity, at least a momentary failure to celebrate the ivriness, shall we say, of what it means to be a Jew. Mianochi, asking himself, who am I? And then becoming a leader, becoming such a leader that he's prepared to lose out on himself for the people. And learning the words to say to God that when Am Israel do sin, he can seek their pardon. Having explained all this, let's now talk about Yonah. Who is Yonah? Well, according to the Ushalmi and Peter Abeliezer, he was a child of the widow whom Eliyahu and Navi miraculously brought back to life. A child who died and was resuscitated by Eliyahu and Avi. What that tells us is, having experienced that, but also growing up in a home without a father, his early life was also filled with miracles and with challenges. At the same time, Eliyahu, according to Chazal, was a mentor, a teacher of Yonah. And in contrast to Moshe's self-doubt, Eliyahu was a firebrand. Unlike Moshe, who was prepared to give up parts of himself for the sake of Am Yisrael, unlike Moshe, who was always defending the child of God, even in response to the honor of God, Eliyahu always stood up for God. So who is Yonah? He's somebody who has similarities to Moshe. We'll see that in a second. But also is somewhat shaped by his mentor, by his teacher, Eliyahu. And in fact, Chazal do point out a number of areas where Yonah and Moshe have a similar experience. And to begin with, Let's look at the opening psukim of Sefer Yonah. You have this in source six. What are the opening psukim of Sefer Yonah? Well, this is where HaKadosh Baruch Hu speaks to Yonah ben Amitai, and he tells him to go to Nimzeh, to preach to them. And we know that Yonah is reluctant. He says, I'd rather not, thanks. And already here, Chazal in the Medrash Tanchuma see a strong parallel between Moshe and Yonah. Don't forget when HaKadosh Baruch spoke to Moshe at the snare, did Moshe say, sure, I'll go, or did it take a whole week to push and push and push him? Moshe too was reluctant to take on a mission from God. You can see this in the Medrash Tanchuma, which I hope I've brought for you. Saw seven. When HaKadosh wills it, even things, parts of your body, you think you have rule over and you don't have rule over. Natan Chuma goes on to say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted Moshe to be a leader and Moshe said no. He said no. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I'm going to make you. And he persuaded him. Such that they describe as if Moshe's, walk, Moshe's legs walk, even though he didn't really want them to. 
He was, he was a reluctant leader even after that week of negotiation with the Kaddish Baruch. And similarly so, says the Tan Chuma. A Kaddish Baruch who speaks to Yonah, and Yonah says, I don't want to be involved in this mission. And Hashem says, we'll just see about that. And then we know the story of the fish that takes him. As if to say, not everything is just under your control. Kaddish Baruch was telling both of them and other Nevi'im mentioned here in the Tan Chuma, that I too have a role to play in the things you do in your life. So there are similarities between Yonah and Moshe. And at this point, I'd like to read the first excerpt, and I'm going to read a few portions of it from a really majestic insight about Sefer Yonah by Rabbi Tversky. You can see this on Source 12. It's from the book, Prayer for the Yours. You may have it at home. In the section on Yom Kippur. We're reflecting right now on Yonah as somebody who's been given a mission, but somebody who's seemingly refusing the mission. As mentioned, HaKadosh Baruch Hu still has a way to get people to do what he wants, even if he has to choreograph a few things. But says Rabbi Twarski the following. I can recall as a child, being fascinated by the story of Yonah, the stormy sea, Yonah sleeping in the hold of the ship, the casting of lots to see whose sin was responsible for the storm, the casting of Yonah into the sea to be swallowed by a whale. I remember asking my teacher how a prophet could think that he could run away from God. Even as a child, I knew that God was everywhere. How could a prophet not know what I knew as an eight-year-old child? I didn't remember what my teacher answered, probably because the answers were unsatisfactory. As I grew older, I read the explanations given by Torah commentaries. And I realized that Yonah did not think he could run away from God. It was his mission that he was trying to evade for what he felt for valid reasons. But yet, just like some juvenile ideas may not be totally eliminated when one matures, so did the question of my childhood continue to disturb me. How could a prophet try to run away from the mission God had commanded? So that's, that's a question that bothered Rabbi Twersky, even as an 80-year-old child. Now, of course, on first glance, the idea of any prophet, any Navi, refusing to do a mission, refusing to fulfill their task as a Navi is difficult to understand, it's perplexing. But then when we think about Moshe Rabbeinu and the parallels between him and Yonah, perhaps it's not so hard to understand. Both Moshe and Yonah defended the people at the cost of their own lives. As Chazal say, and here I'm quoting from a source eight from Abot the Rabbi Nathan. Yona tava kavod haben, vlo tava kavod haav. Yona believed that he was protecting the honor of the son, namely the Jewish people, by ignoring the honor of the father. I mentioned that he acts in contrast to Eliyahu, who was tava kavod haav, vlo tava kavod haben. Yet, in direct contrast to Moshe, when the storm is at its height, he doesn't doubt whether he's a Mitzri or an Ivri. He doesn't ask like Marsha asks me, Anochi. Instead, with a kind of assertiveness that he would have learned from his mentor, Eliyahu, what does Yonah say when he's asked by the captain of the ship, what's going on? What does he proclaim proudly? Unlike Moshe Rabbeinu in Midian, what does he see? see what does he say? Ivri Anochi. I'm an Ivri. Unlike Moshe, who doubted himself, who didn't challenge those who referred to him as a Mitzri and who communicated through his words of Mi Anochi, an identity crisis of sorts, Yonah seemingly knows exactly who he is. He knows what is Anochi. He knows he is an Ivri. And then what happens? What happens in the story? There's a storm. 
Yonah knows it's about him. Does he daven? Well, possibly. But he suggests to say there's something which is hard to make sense of. He tells them, throw me into the sea. Lift me up, throw me into the water. The water will subside when that happens. Why does he say this? Where does that come from? The answer, I'd like us to take an even closer look at Sefer Yonah. And in so doing, highlight further parallels between his life and that of Moshe. And in particular, what's going on in the life of Yonah and Kriyat Yamsuf. To begin with, when Yonah proclaims Ivri Anochi, look at how the Pasuk then continues. Something very strange in terms of what he explains by that term. He says, Ivri Anochi, I'm an Ivri, but Hashem Alokei Hashemayim Aneyare, the Lord of heaven, do I fear, who created the sea and the dry land. Why refer to Hashem as the sea and the dry land? Why not Shemayim Ba'aret, as we classically do? What were the two elements that we saw in the early life of Moshe? What are the two things that saved Moshe? Water and sand. What are the two things that Moshe doesn't hit? Water and sand. And what is really the miracle, the nest of Kriyat Yamsu, the separation of water and sand? By referring to the fact that he believes in the God, Asher Asata Yamet Abasa. Yonah is suddenly referring to Moshe and to Kriyat Yamsuf. He sees himself somewhat as being a Moshe-like figure. That's not just where the parallels end. We're told that the storm had been created. <clears throat> and that reminds us of the Ruach Kadim, of the wind that that led to the splitting of Yamsuf, right? Beyond this, we'll see a few more parallels to Yona and Moshe Rabbeinu and Kriyat Yamsuf. But we haven't yet answered the question, why does Yona think that throwing his body into the water will calm the sea? To answer, let's look at source nine from Tilim Kuf Yudalit. Words from Hallel that we sing. But Zayt Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, Bet Yaakov mi Am Loez, Aita Yudal Kotro Yisrael mi Am Shlotav, Hayam Ra'a V'yanos, Hayarden Yisov Le'achol. The water saw and it, and it fleed. What did Hazal say? What did the water see? The led it to flee. The Madrash offers a number of answers. One, perhaps, best known is Ra'a Arono Shel Yosef. It saw the casket of Yosef, the bones of Yosef. Remember the Yosef who identified himself as his Ri, who is now en route to be buried into Eretz Yisrael. The water sees Aronosh el Yosef and parts. So what's the story of Yonah saying, throw me into the water? He does almost a kalbachome. If the water split for Yosef, in an Aaron, they'll die down for me. Because Yonah sees himself in that moment of Yamsuf. He sees himself as a Moshe like figure, but with some slight emendations, without the self doubt, right? more assertive. He sees himself as being a redeemer of Am Yisrael. He sees himself as being a Goel of sort to defend the people of Israel, as did Moshe. And so he says to the sailors, throw me into the water. I have confidence that the waters will come. 
Now, principally, if you'd never read Yona before, the story should end now. They throw him in the water, he dies, there's no storm. Okay, Kachazet. But the story doesn't end there. Instead, what happens? Yona is swallowed by a big fish. He's there for three days. And in so doing, he's taught a very simple lesson. You're not the only decider of your fate. You don't decide what your mission is. You don't decide how the nature will respond to your presence. You don't determine whether you live or die. It's up to Akash Bochu. It's at this point I'd like to now look at a further section from Rabbi Tversky. Who notes, we read the story at Minchan Yom Kippur to reassure us that nothing stands in the way of tshuva. We should be confident that if our tshuva and Yom Kippur is sincere, all our sins will be forgiven. We begin the new year with a clean slate. But there is another message in this dramatic epic. Perhaps the Torah is telling us the virtue of the prophet. This is the only time he sought to evade his mission. We are far more inferior than Yona because we so often evade our mission. We often try to flee from God. Continues Rabbi Tversky. The Talmud tells us that before Anishama descends to earth, it is given the charge, be a tzaddik. That is our mission. But being a tzaddik isn't easy. It's so restrictive. We must always be honest and truthful. We may not speak disparagingly of others. We must be respectful of others. We dare not insult others. We may not be vain. We must be humble. We must dedicate every free moment to Torah study. We must accept the adversities we experience as just. These and the host of pleasurable activities which are prohibited by the Torah may well inconvenience us. We often succumb to the law of the Yetzirah and fail to fulfill our mission on being a tzaddik. We do be believe the watchful eye of God is upon us. and We feel guilty for our failure. Like Adam in the Garden of Eden, we may try to hide from God. Like Yona, we may try to flee from him. As Rabbi Tuas continues, we may try to flee into work, into amusements, into indulgence, or into chemicals that will anesthetize the distressing feeling of guilty or distract ourselves from it. The existential question continues to eat away at us, subconsciously, if not consciously. Why do you think you are here? What is the purpose and goal of life? Why are you not pursuing that goal? We try to flee, to escape the nagging question. But just like Yona could not flee from God, neither can we. Firstly, what Rabbi Tversky does here is majestic because what he makes us do is rather than judge Yona, we should look at ourselves and know that so often we flee from our mission. So often we run away from our tasks. We're coming back to the story. Where is Yona now? He's in the belly of a fish, okay? But what is the belly of a fish like? Anybody know? Well, if you look at source 11, the Majesty Tant Chuma, we're told. It's as if Yona has entered into a giant shul, a giant synagogue. Why, why is a belly of a fish? compared to a shul. But what is Yonah doing? Daven. What is Yonah supposed to be doing? Daven. Hashem has sent this fish for Yonah to have a second look at himself. And what is the moment when we have a second look at ourselves? It's when we daven. When we pray, we connect to God, and in so doing, we connect ourselves. And that's what Yonah does. He davens. But I want us to pay attention to what he actually says. 
because by doing so, you may well be surprised. This is now in Perek Bet of Yonah. If you go back to source six, Yonah Perek Bet. What, what imagery does Yonah describe when praying in the belly of the fish? He uses imagery from the life of Moshe. He thinks again that he is like Moshe. Nefesh referring to how the waters came to the noses. He thinks that he is somehow bringing redemption to the world the way Moshe split the sea. Came down from the mountain. Who came down the mountain? Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain. What does that remind us of? That beautiful teaching of Gemara Shana. Shakrish Baruchu was mit atef keshliach tzibur. And showed Moshe Rabbeinu, when you, when you do these with you and me dot, then you'll be able to bring mercy to the world. Why is this significant? Hashem wants Yonah to be Yonah. And he thinks he's somebody else. He sees himself as trying to fulfill Moshe's mission. Of saving Am Yisrael. He sees his function as being a defender of Am Yisrael. Tava covered a ben below Tava covered a av. He sees himself as a redeemer, like Moshe, taking the people from sorrow and trouble to a better place. Hashem doesn't want Yona to be Moshe. Hashem wants Yona. Yona. He's in a shul and a fish. His task is to pray for himself, talk about his own life journey, to connect to his own mission, to have an understanding that right now, because the Bog is sending to Ninveh, not a Jewish city, to fulfill what Hashem is asking him to do. And yet, Yona is somehow insistent that his task is to be like another prophet. And it's at this point I want to read a little bit more from this wonderful insight of Rabbi Twersky. What does he say? The human body is comprised of a body and a neshama. The body is essentially an animal body. Our uniqueness lies in the neshama. Our real self is the neshama, which very much wishes to fulfill its mission. When we succumb to the wiles of the yetzara, we are not only running away from God, but we are fleeing from our true self. Just as it is impossible to flee from God, so it is impossible to escape from one's own self. We take the self wherever, with us wherever we go. But this is a mistake that Yonah does. He's trying to be somebody else. All the imagery of the soul, all the idea of him coming down the mountain. And we'll see. We'll see how it continues. In some way, he thinks himself like Yosef, throw me into the water. In some measure, he is taking from his mantle, Eliyahu, Avery I knock that fire brand thing. But in some measure, he's trying to be like Moshe. But he's not Eliyahu. He's not Yosef, and he's not Moshe. And as long as he doesn't accept himself or connect with his own unique mission, Yana remains confused and frustrated. We often think of Sefer Yona as being the story of Tshuva of the people of Ninveh. But the true meaning of Tshuva is about connecting with turning to the self. And the problem is that Yona is trying to be somebody else. As Rabbi Twersky so remarkably explains, in my work with alcoholics, I've seen how alcohol is used in an effort to escape. Escape what? Escape themselves. They continue this futile effort until it brings them down. They finally reach a point where this, they realize that the escape does not and cannot work. 
we refer to this as hitting rock bottom. When they hit rock bottom, they can begin to recover. The stormy sea which threatened to drown Yona and all the others on board was Yona's rock bottom. He recognized that he couldn't flee from his mission. The rest of the epic tells of Yona's return and it, to, to carry out his own mission. We need not experience a stormy sea, nor anything like the rock bottom of the alcoholic. However, we should realize that escaping our mission is futile. We can then start our recovery. We can stop our running away from ourselves. We can realize that our true selves wishes to fulfill its mission, and we will allow it to do so. Now, having explained all this, I want to go back to Moshe. Feel free to look back at the earlier Sukim in Peregim. Moshe doubts himself and he says, Mi anochi ki elech el pao. Who am I that I'm going to go to Pharaoh? But look at the Sukim that follow. What does Hashem say when Moshe questions his very anochi? Hashem says, Yomel ki yemchach. He says, I'll be with you, and this will be a sign that I, which is using the word Anochi, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you to fulfill your mission of taking the people out of Israel. Moshe questions what it means to be Anochi himself. Hashem reassures him, he says, your Anochi, I'll be with you. Wherever you are, I'll be there right next to you. And there's something exquisite that happens in the next Pasuk. Moshe affirms it. He says, Hine Anochi Ba El He says, I'm going to go to the Jewish people. He questions me Anochi. Hashem says, Anochi, I'll be with you. And that means you should know your task. And Moshe, as if to say, nods his head and says, You're right, Hashem. I understand now what it means to be Anochi. I understand who I am, what my mission is, what my purpose is. He proceeds then to be the savior of the Jewish people. Moshe is filled with self doubt. <clears throat> He's unsure who he is, but Hashem tells him what his mission is, and though still reluctant, he accepts it and what it means in terms of his own destiny. But now let's look at what happened to Yona. Yona begins in a very different place. He's not filled with self doubt. He thinks he knows exactly who he is. Irianochi! He says that loud and clear. In fact, he's not even really asked that question. He is certain, I am an Ivy. Yet in every single thing he does, he's trying to be like other people. He's trying to be like Yosef. He's trying to be like Moshe. He's trying to be like Eliyahu. And rather than trying to save the people of Nineveh, which is what Hashem has asked him to do, Yonah tried to protect Am Israel. As did Moshe, and he continues with his policy of Tava covered a ben, Rulai Tava covered Av. I'm going to stand up for the people, even if I ignore your Kaddish Baal. Hashem says, I know what I asked you to do. That's not your job. That's not even, that's not your mission. So, what happened? Let's look at the beginning of Perak Gimel of Sefer Yona. You're now begins with this assertive, certain Ivri Anochi. The beginning now of Perak Gimel, having now been in the belly of a fish, Hashem speaks to him again. Like Moshe Hashem says, I, Anochi, am now telling you very clearly to go to Nimbeh, and I'll be with you in your personal mission. What we don't have with you now, which we did have with Moshe, is that graceful nod, that acceptance of who he is. There isn't that thrice 
appearance of Anochi. With Moshe, it was me Anochi. Then Hashem said, Anochi, I'll be with you. Moshe says, okay, Anochi, I'll go. With Yona, I know who I am. Hashem says, you don't seem to know anything about what I'm asking you to do. He puts him through the rounds. He sends him to the belly of the fish. He puts him in a shul. He says, Davin, when you Davin, you should find yourself. And Yona is davening as if he's Moshe Rabbeinu about the sur. He's davening as if he was coming down the mountain. Hashem says, no, no, I need you to be you. I will be with you. Anochi, I'll be with you. But Yona, he, he doesn't seem to want to be that. And it's at this point where I respectfully, briefly part ways with the approach of Rabbi Twarski. He says, from then on after the fish, Yona finds his mission. I don't think he does. I don't think Yona recovers. Because I think until the end of the Sefer, Yona refuses to accept his mission. And in so doing, refuses truly to accept himself. Yona goes to Nineveh. By the way, he's not really told what to say to the people in Nineveh. He starts to go. God empowers him to figure out what to say. <laughs> and then what happens? Here we're told, and this is Perak Dalet, for those who are looking, saw six, Pasuk Bet. Moshe goes to Nineveh. What, what quantity of time does he give the people of Nineveh to repent? 40 days. Do you see a parallel there? He's still thinking, Moshe! Who was asked to? Was he told to tell them 40 days? He's thinking as if he's still walking the steps of somebody else. And then the people do do tshuva. And Hashem sees him, Asim. And what does Yona do in return? He takes the Yukim Umido and says him back to Kodesh Baruchu. Ki ata el chanun brachum er chapayim rab chesed nicham al ha-ra'ah. He says, you're so merciful. Take me. Why? Could have done tshuva. Just think about it. Hashem tells Moshe, when the people, when the Jewish people sin, say these words so I will pardon them. Here, the people that are in there are doing what Hashem wants. And Yona is saying these words because he can't tolerate it. Because Yona is stuck in the groove of trying to save Amiswell, not Ninveh. And in fact, he goes on to say, I'd rather die than live. He doesn't want to be the prophet that God needs him to be. He doesn't want to be Yona. He wants to be Moshe. He wants to save the Jewish people. He wants to have the 40 days. He wants to come down the mountain. He wants to cross the Yamsuf. He wants to calm the waters. And Hashem is saying, that's not you. That's not you. That's not my mission to you. He's still having an identity crisis. Moshe says, me Anochi, and Hashem then gives him reassurance. He says, ah, I understand who Anochi is. Yona is so certain, but in the end, he doesn't know who he is. If he Anochi, really? If Ibi Anochi was truly clear in your mind, you would have done what Hashem said. You're trying to be a different type of prophet. So what does Hashem do? The last parak of Yona is God's last try to try and Knock some sense into Yona. No, Moshe, you're somebody else. You have a different mission. Don't want to die because people are doing tshuva. Don't invoke the Yukimu Midot Shel Rachim because people are doing what I asked them to do. So what does Yona do? He sits in a sukkah and alongside him is a miraculous type of bush, tree. 
And you're not at all. Hashem is, Hashem is remind, understanding that I am like Moshe. I'm like the Moshe who took the Jewish people in the wilderness and they stayed in Sukkot. He's giving me this miraculous plant like, like Moshe with a snare. God is about to affirm who I really am. That I'm, I'm like my, my role model. And then what does Hashem do? The Pasuk says, Hashem sends a Ruach Kadim. No, that's exactly the same term we use with respect to the Yamsu. He destroys the Kikayon. He destroys what's giving Yonah trade. He says, you are not Moshe. You are not there at the Yamsuf. You're not by the snare. You're not in the Midbar. You're not coming down the mountain. You don't need to be invoking Yigimon Midot Shel Rachamim. You need to be the Navi I'm asking you to be. That's your task. You see all this? You see how I've decimated it? I want you to see that. You aren't him. You need to accept who you are. You need to accept your mission. And understood this way. Your night is a very painful story in many ways. It's somebody who's certain of who he is, but realizes he's trying to be somebody else, which so speaks to today's day and age. People are certain about their identity. They know who they are. They're just trying to copycat other people. In their actions, they think they're walking the steps of others. In their deeds, they think they're fulfilling the missions of others. In their values, they think they're performing the work of others. And Hashem is begging each one of us, I created you unique. Be that. Celebrate your uniqueness. Don't run away from who you are. Don't be like that alcoholic who is in denial of who they are, numbing yourself, pretending you're something else. What was a moment where things could have gotten better and they didn't? What was a chance Hashem sent to your now? So there was a chance when he was in the belly of the fish for three days. The belly of the fish, which according to Tanchuma and other Midrashim, was like a big shul. What a chance to daven. Well, what is davening? I'm going to quote to you from Rav Soloveitchik in his Grisha essay, Redemption Prayer, Talmud Torah. He says, God needs neither thanks nor hymns. He wants to hear the outcry of man confronted with a ruthless reality. I haven't provided this, but I'll send this to you. He expected prayer to rise from a suffering world cognizant of its genuine need. In short, through prayer, man finds himself. Prayer enlightens man about his needs. It tells man the story of his hidden hopes and expectations. It teaches him how to behold the vision and how to strive in order to realize this vision. When to be satisfied with what one possesses. When to reach out for more. In a word, man finds his need awareness himself in prayer. Of course, the very instance he finds himself, he becomes a redeemed being. The time, the moment, the opportunity for Yonah to reconnect himself, the time, the opportunity for each of us to truly find ourselves within to be that. As Rafael well, Soloveitchik says, it's when we pray where we connect to God and therefore we connect with our true self. He was given those three days. He was trying to be somebody else. What he should have done is say, who am I? What he should have done is truly be like Moshe. Rather than with that confidence of Ibi Anochi, ask me Anochi, okay, help me out here. Who do you want me to be? What is your expectation? What is my mission in the world? Help me understand me. And therefore, do your will in the world. And the secret of all this story 
is that word anochi. The question of anochi and then hearing the answer from God and being at peace with it has much in it. Or in contrast, Yonah's insistence, he knows how Anochi is, and Kodesh Boko says, no, you're somebody else. We're reflecting on the Tefillahs of Yom Kippur. I was reminded of the Pasuk in Yeshayahu. Anochi, 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 Help me be the Anochi to help you understand what it means to be Anochi. And that's how we achieve Shuva, to return to self. If through connecting with the Kodesh we connect to self. Through doing Shuva, that we find ourselves. Some people read Sefer Yonah and say, it's a book about the Shuva of the people of Ninja. I see it, why well, I now see it, as being a story of somebody who dances around still yet to discover their self. Somebody is on a journey for Truba, not quite yet finding it. Who is aggrieved when things don't go the way they think it should go, not always realizing that that's exactly the way God wants it to be. And I see you're not as does Rabbi Tversky and every single one of us. The difference is that this was one mission of his in terms of us. Many of our missions often, we presume, we think we know. We fail to put our faith in God. We fail to truly come to prayer willing to be nurtured by the Ratzon Hashem. Read your nah on Mincha Yom Kippur as the holiest day of the year ebbs away. We cry out to God, Anuchi, Anuchi, Hashem, we love you. Hashem, we believe in you. Help us understand us. Help us know our task, our mission, our purpose for the coming year. And the Drat Hashem, when we finish that story, unlike Yonah, who sits miserable with a destroyed Kitayon tree in the heat, realizing he was trying to be somebody he's not, we were able to step out from Yom Kippur with greater clarity of who we are. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer, not necessarily that I have any answers.